All right. Official welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Dana Ripper. We're here with Ethan Duke, also of the Missouri River Bird Observatory, and our mission is conservation via science, education, and advocacy. And tonight we have a special guest. Um, this is Crystal Antone. She'll tell you a little bit more about herself, but uh, before she begins, I want to thank her profusely for mentoring the Bird Safe Kansas City Project when MRBO started, started that project in 2019, she was just crucial to the development of the project in our study design. So Crystal, thank you. And we're really glad to have you and you can go ahead and take it away, my friend. Okay. Um, so I'm Crystal Antone and I'm with the Center for Sustainability at Johnson County Community College. That's in Overland Park, Kansas, which is a suburb of Kansas City, if you're not from this area. Um, and I'm going to talk tonight about light pollution and its effects, effects on wildlife, among other things, and then my bird window collision study, and then show you some solutions you can help um, implement to help birds migrate more safely in both of those areas. So we are um, members of Lights Out Heartland. This is a regional organization that deals with light pollution in this area. Um, you can join the, the group and attend monthly Zoom meetings and then work on lights out projects in your area if you'd like, um, we'd love to have you. Um, and let's jump right into this. So let's talk about light pollution. I'm gonna go through these slides pretty quickly. Um, so this is the 1950s. Uh, this is 1970s. This is the 1990s. And this is the prediction for 2025. And you can see that with um, light pollution and its bleed over, there are very, very few places in the US that have dark skies anymore and almost all of them are out west. So that's highlighting our area specifically. So this is Kansas City, St. Louis and Springfield and where we kind of sit amongst all that light pollution. <clears throat> So dark skies has this illustration, which shows like the sky around the inner city and then works its way out to dark sky sites. Um, and they are mostly concerned with like astronomy and being able to see constellations and that type of thing. Uh, and the Bortle scale is the nine level numeric scale that measures the night sky's brightness. So this is how well you can see those astronomical, astronomical, <laughs> sorry, I can't pronounce words right now. It has to do with astronomy as well. Anyway, um, and you can see like the worst is around the city and then excellent dark sky, which we do not get to experience in this part of the country at all anymore. So this is Northern Minnesota where I grew up. And I really took that sky for granted because I don't get to see this type of sky here. And the, um, the only other place that I've see, like been in awe of the night sky is in Colorado. And it's so dark and the moon's so bright that it casts shadows when you go out into it. And it's always amazing to me how bright the night sky is when you're in a really dark place. And so scientists have, or yeah, scientists have created this term called nectalgia. It means sky grief. And um, that's something that you may or may not suffer from. I feel like I've lost my connection to nature to some degree because I hardly ever get to see the stars anymore living in Kansas City. So one thing um, that comes up when you talk about dark skies um, so I brought this up with our facilities people here at the college, and the first thing they said to me is, you can't just have people walking around in the dark, um, but that's not what that means at all. So there are light fixtures that protect the sky, and you can see the, these examples here, and then I have some examples that are right on my campus, um, which I have explained to them <laughs> that this is what I mean. So you can see these are three locations. They are right next to each other. So this new building with the shielded lights, you can see the difference between that and the parking lot, which is actually almost in the position that it is in the photo. And then the older library building is sort of on the other side of this arts building. 
Um, and you can just see the difference in the lighting on each of these buildings. So I took all these pictures the same night at the same time. And our arts building has um, dark sky lighting. And you can tell, like when you walk around that building, you just feel calmer. And I get that even from the picture, right? There's not glare, it's not overly bright. It actually feels safer than that parking lot, which is overly lit. When something's overly lit, it can make you feel unsafe because you're like, why are they doing this, right? Um, but also it can create hard shadows where people can hide. But we certainly, we have issues. Um, we have about the worst uh, light fixtures on campus. They are open top globes. So they, they blow light upwards, downwards, and outwards. Actually, they downwards is the least amount of light that it puts out. Um, and our parking lot lights are LED, but they're not well shielded and they're too bright and the wrong color. And then you can see in our parking garage, lighting is so bright. Um, and that's the picture on the right there. Those are robins, they're foraging. It's 930 at night and there's robins foraging in the lawn around our parking garage. So we definitely have um, light pollution issues here on campus that I have started that conversation. Um, I'm working with the astronomy, astronomy department. We got um, light meters to test lights at night to see how bad it is in certain locations. I'm trying to figure out retrofits for the existing lights to keep them from shining upwards. Um, we're working with students to fund and implement those retrofits. And then I'm trying to get a drone flyover after 11 p.m. to see like what is exactly creating light pollution other than the most obvious things, because um, I'm sure that I'm missing something somewhere looking at it from the ground. So some of the things about lighting is, um, you know, it needs to be necessary and useful. It should have a clear purpose. It shouldn't just light things up. I hate to say decorative lighting at night is probably not the greatest thing, <laughs> but um, you should consider how it impacts the environment and can consider the wildlife and whether reflective markers or like glow in the dark um, stripes or something would work for that area while it's being used. A lot of things aren't used like all night long. They just need to last, um, you know, to like 10 or midnight. And then if they fade out or something, that wouldn't matter. Um, so the targeted light should only be directed where it's needed. Everything else is called spillover or up light. Um, and this can be really bad if you have neighbors that don't care and they're they're blowing light into your yard or into your windows, which can be super annoying if you're trying to sleep. Lighting should be controlled. So um, you should try to have lights off after 11 p.m. So putting them on timers or motion detectors, using shielded fixtures, solar lights that burn out later in the evening. I have those along my, my walkways around my home. You know, they last till maybe 10, 11 o'clock and then they really start to fade out and they're pretty, they're all gone by morning. Um, and then pull the shades on your windows, especially during migration, just to keep that light from spilling over into your yard. And keep the light levels low. So this is an example of how hard shadows can create um, spaces where people could hide. Um, this is something that maybe as a woman I think about more, but is there someone standing beside the garage that could sneak in after I drive in or something because I can't see them. They're in that really dark spot. So the picture on the right would be a preferred way to light the um, area. And you can see that it actually shows more of the space around it without creating so many hard shadows. It also wouldn't uh, annoy your neighbors as much. And then light color is really important too. So at night, you don't want to put out the color of light that is most common at noon, right? So you would like to do sunrise or sunset type lighting, um, warmer colors, limiting your blue light, Blue light actually has a short wavelength um, and it scatters 10 times more than warm light. So that actually makes it really hard on your eyes and hard for you to focus on it. Um, but the 2700 range 
um, provides excellent color and minimizes the blue and then 2200 if you're in a sensitive environment. But really bright lights also suppress melatonin and this disrupts your circadian rhythms. So it affects sleep or mating patterns or you know something in all living things. And I have to say that I don't know why, but I have several things in my bedroom where it seems like the little light that they they use to show you that it's on is always blue. And it annoys me more than any other thing in the entire bedroom. I swear, I don't know why they do that. So this is a neighborhood that embraced the dark sky philosophy. You can see the big changes that they made um, with the way that they're lighting things and they used more motion detectors. So the lights only come on when needed. And that would be like the ideal situation if we could have that type of lighting everywhere so that we could see the sky, not disrupt migrations, not affect bugs and those types of things. Um, and I believe this example is from California. And so light pollution is also bad for us. Like I said, it inhibits our view of the night sky. I feel like we lose our sense of wonder and our connectedness to nature and each other by not being able to see the night sky. I don't know if you've ever looked up when you've seen the stars and wondered, you know, thought about somebody else that you know that's maybe seeing the same stars that you are. Unfortunately, one in three people can't actually see most of those stars anymore. Um, and light clutter is confusing while driving at night. So I don't know if any of you are in the category of aging, um, but I am. And light clutter is gotten really bad for me. If I have to wear glasses when I drive and that only like makes things about 50% better. And, you know, I'm wondering like, am I gonna have to start stop driving at night when I'm like 55 years old? I hope not, because like that's next year. So, um, and again, with the sleep issues, it can really exacerbate health issues if you don't get a good night's sleep. It affects your heart. It can um, help create diabetes. It can help um, you put like keep on weight and not be able to use it. So there's lots of things that light can do to you if you have it around you while you're trying to sleep. So light pollution is bad for bugs. And one of the reasons that's important is for birds, right? So birds eat a lot of bugs, um, five to 9,000 insects to raise a brood of chickadees, barn swallows, they're consuming six, 60 insects an hour, um, and hummingbirds, which, you know, everyone loves to he feed the hummingbirds nectar, but they actually need um, protein. So they are dependent on spiders and insects as a food source as well. Um, and light pollution, the, the other reason it's bad for birds is it's, um, <laughs> it's a significant decline of the insect population. So you get habitat loss, um, and then light pollution is one of the other major things. Mayflies, they live for one day and they look for polarized light, but then they end up laying their eggs on the lighted concrete. Um, fireflies lose their drive to mate and the dorsal light response. So that keeps bugs trapped in the lights until they die. And so, um, whoa, I thought I had another slide in here. Oh, that right there is the dorsal light response. So um, there's been some studies that have come out recently that show that bugs are not just confused by the lights, but they have a dorsal light response, which means that when they get into a light source, they're trying to keep the back of themselves to the light the whole time, because that should be like the sun. Um, but because it's a light source, it's coming from every direction. So they just sort of spin around in the light and then they never are able to get out of it. So that's some um, fairly new information about why bugs get trapped in these light, um, light sources. And then, from this picture, you can see like these bugs are never going to mate. Um, they're never going to lay any eggs. And this whole generation of insects is going to die. And then after that, all the generations that they would have produced are lost forever. So this is a big part of um, why bugs are 
uh, losing a lot of population, and we should be very concerned about it. They also um, pollinate a lot of our crops. So night migration, um, birds use the moon and the stars to help chart their course. Of course, if they can't see those, that can be an issue, but it's also cooler air and there's fewer pres presidents, and there's also fewer predators. Um, half of the bird species in North America are migratory, and they come through the Mississippi Flyway, which is where we're, we are situated in, and 80% of those birds migrate at night. Um, the altitude that birds fly, it turns out, on the East Coast is closer to the ground than it is on the West Coast. And I am not exactly sure why that is, but that makes Kansas City number eight and St. Louis number six on um, the most dangerous cities for birds. Of course, Chicago's number one. And so as an example, this is October 5th, 2023. This is BirdCast. Um, you can watch birds migrating on this. They are tracking it with radar. And this is, uh, you can see, does it say what time of night it is? I can't tell. Um, anyway, this is about the middle of the night. You can see how many birds are up in the air. It's very high. Chicago's in the same um, flyway as we are. And this is McCormick Place. So it killed about a thousand birds that night. Um, they were very attracted to the lights of this building. It also is situated right on Lake Michigan. And this is one of the more recent tragedies. Um, and then this is the Twin Towers. And I don't know, maybe you've heard about this, but birds get trapped in that light as well. Um, the Twin Tower Memorial. And they have to turn the lights off for 20 minutes and get the birds back out of the lights and then turn them on again. And Im immediately when they turn them on, the birds start to circle in the lights again. So they're very confused by these bright lights shooting up into the sky. And then um, there's this story. So this is a, a tall building. They used to light it with floodlights. Um, in 2017, a whole bunch of birds flew into it and died. So, um, they began a lights out initiative afterwards. And so this is what the building looks like on the left when they had it lit up the old way and on the right when they have it lit up the new way. So this is a big improvement, not lighting that entire building like that, turning lights off at night. Um, and they I don't believe they've suffered those types of um, losses again. So those big crashes are the ones you hear about the most. Um, McCormick Place would fall into this low rise um, mortality at low rises, but most of the ones you hear about on the news are going to be from very tall buildings. But that's not where most birds are dying from window kills. Um, it's at residences. So if you've had one bird strike on your house, everyone in your neighborhood has had at least one bird strike on their house too. And um, on a campus like mine, our tallest building is four stories. That's one building. Everything else is pretty much two story. And we kill hundreds of birds a year on our buildings. So um, one thing to note is that, that Ethan brought up with me is to mention Falco. If anybody remembers Falco, he was the eagle that escaped the zoo in New York. And he recently was also um, killed in a bird strike on a uh, building in New York. So that was a very unfortunate outcome for him. He lived for an entire year on his own. And this is um, my bird study. So I started this in 2015. Well, I started at the college in 2015. And this is what I was finding. And I didn't really understand like the mechanism for these birds dying. I knew it had to do with the windows uh, because they are always in front of the windows. But I was finding four or five birds sometimes on the same place, on the same section of windows. And so I started a crowdsource study in 2017 and just asked people like, tell me if they see a dead bird or a bird hit the window or whatever. And I got 82 reports back from that. Um, then I asked for all the historical service tickets that had the word bird in it. 
back to 2012 and um and we found several indi like several times that birds call birds called people called to have birds removed that were dead in their area um and then let's see oh yeah right so i talked to grounds to help me do this study and i talked to them about how many birds they were finding and they all agreed that they don't find more than a couple a year so that was interesting but they promised they'd report them to me and then um they ended up actually reporting the most birds that we found well by reports that we didn't look for so this is the the uh, walking patterns that we use to walk the buildings um, it's broken up into three different sections right now each one's about um, a half a mile and it takes 20 minutes if you don't find any birds and about 30 minutes if you do and then this is our photo data sequence that we use to um, record the birds. So we take a context photo of the building with the bird in the photo so we can kind of see the layout of how it happened. Um, whether there's a mark on the window, in this case, there were red feathers on that upper window with the yellow circle there. And then we take, uh, we fill out this tag with all the information on it. And then we do three photos, the ventral, lateral, and dorsal of the bird so that it can be identified. We put that on to iNaturalist. Um, this is something that you are welcome to follow and um, identify birds on. Uh, we have a, a pretty good following of people who come on there and identify birds for us or confirm identifications for us. In the beginning, like I didn't know how to ID almost any birds. I knew like robins and stuff, um, but now I'm really good at it, except for yellow. A lot of the yellow birds I still have problems with. So. You can see this is fairly updated. We have 1,119 observations. We've had 100 different species hit windows on our campus. So that's everything from your very typical American robin. Um, we've had a woodcock, we've had a bobwhite quail, um, several hawks, and um, and everything in between. So. This is what we found the first year that we did the study. So we had 166 deaths in the first half of the year, 121 in the second half. We had 42 injured birds, 20 of them which we were able to um, catch and take to Operation Wildlife, and 17 of those 20 survived. Um, we estimate that we missed about 30% of the birds uh, that fly off or that get taken by predators because we have um, coyotes, fox, and feral cats on campus, raccoons, possums. Um, but that 30% is kind of based on, I don't know, a feeling. It's not very scientific. So um, that's kind of where we're at with that. I, I can't prove it to be otherwise. So we're just, we've just gone with that. It's probably realistic, however. And then we found these different issues. So we have the see-through glass um, that birds would try to fly through. And I figured out they were doing that because there were also birds on the backside of it on the roof that had tried to fly through the glass. Um, we have reflections of the environment. So lots of trees reflecting in the glass. We have these bird funnels where our buildings all come to bees and it just sort of herds the birds into the corners. Um, and then we have a lot of bridges. So you can see that bridge actually creates an optical illusion even for people because it looks like the reflection in the bridge is actually the tree that's behind the bridge and not the one in front of it. So um, if you can imagine approaching that at you know 20 miles an hour, it probably isn't very clear what's going on. This is where we are at right now. I literally just got done with running my 2023 data tonight before this um, presentation. So that is the little blue dot there. Um, it looks like that uh, we had 38 birds in May and the blue dot, so that's a reduction that's good in the spring. Um, the fall, it did not really change. So August or September, October, November, the numbers were very close to what 2020 is there. Um, we uh, notably did not have any yellow-billed cuckoos this year. 
Uh, we consistently get four to six a year, even after we've treated windows. I'm not sure why that is, um, but I'm sure that the reason we didn't get any this year is just because their patterns have changed and not because I've worked some sort of magic and made them not you know, run into windows. So we'll see what happens. Um, we just keep continuing to monitor things and, and see um, what's going on. So we do not include robins and morning doves in the data just because they don't follow patterns very well. Um, they just kind of, we call them random robins. And um, migrating birds we find tend to strike the same locations at a rate of about 70%. So whatever that, whatever causes that, um, I can't help the robins, I can't treat that many windows. So we watch for patterns. And so we're treating for migrating birds. Um, this is what it looks like when we were trying to sell the idea of putting dots on the window. So I put three different kinds of dots on the windows. Uh, when they looked at it from the outside, everyone chose the black because it is the least obvious. But when you looked at it from the inside, it turns out that black and white are the most obvious. And then the etched glass is the one we finally went with um, for aesthetic reasons. Of course, you can't uh, buy that off the shelf like you can the white dots. So um, we ended up having them uh, cut by a sign shop, two local sign shops actually, because we've done two rounds of remediation and having them um, installed. So ours are all custom. Uh, you can buy better, you can buy solutions off the shelf that's you know less expensive than what we did. But this is what it looks like if you're sitting in this office. And what people were surprised at is how quickly their eyes adjusted to it. And basically, they don't see the dots anymore. They just see the environment outside. So this is a pattern we chose for the bridges. It's a little bit more decorative. Um, you can see here, I left the material comes in 48 inches. I tried to get the most out of it for the money. I left a space at the top and the bottom. That did not work out the birds kept hitting the space at the top. Um, so I eventually went in and we had filled in, we did the second side of the bridge and we filled in the gap at the top, left the gap at the bottom. And so far we've had no strikes on that bridge anymore. So what I'm finding out is it appears as if birds when faced with an obstacle will tend to correct upwards as opposed to downwards. Um, and so I now leave gaps at the bottom uh, big gaps too, like 18 inch gaps at the bottom and the birds don't seem to hit those. But we just planted a bunch of new trees and they're short, so we'll see what happens. And then this is um, a really good example of unattended consequences. So I treated those windows in yellow the first year thinking that's the most bang for the buck. And immediately the birds just turned the corner and started hitting the other windows. So. I got almost no results for that. Um, eventually we did go in and put dots on all the windows. And then we have had one strike um, on a window with dots and we've had one strike on the man door that's down below that compactor that you can't see. And it does not have dots on there. So um, this is one of the birds, a belted kingfisher that we got on campus. Uh, he did survive and he was released. But um, I started doing the math on how many birds have died on this campus in 50 years, and it's tens of thousands. So um, I feel like this work is really important when you look at that time span and how many like birds we've taken out here on this college campus. Um, so we have almost all low rise buildings, like I said, but residences are actually some of the worst offenders. So if you are having this issue at home, you know, it would be a really good thing if you could do something even during just migration to take care of that. Um, birds that survive window strikes, there's some numbers out there that say like 70% of them will die within 72 hours because they will start a brain bleed from the concussion or because they are slightly injured or have a concussion, they do not act um, defensively and they become predated. Um, if you can pick up a bird, that bird is injured in my opinion, and you should try to get it to rehab. Um, the next best thing you can do it is 
put it in a dark container, a box or a, a paper bag or something so that it doesn't get eaten while it's trying to recover and then release it when it becomes active again. And you're not supposed to feed them or force water on them. And if you can handle them the least amount possible to help avoid stress, that's great as well. Um, solutions for your, for your home are basically the same as they are for the campus. So um, we put four by four inch space dots up. They have been less effective than the um, three by three inch space dots and the two by two inch space dots. So I did replace a bunch of the four by fours with two by two spaced. That's considered hummingbird spacing. And we that will stop a hummingbird from hitting the window. Um, we had like 30 hummingbirds that were killed the first year. Um, we get very few hummingbirds anymore. Oh, and then I was gonna say, oh, that's not on that slide. Okay, I'll say it later. Um, one of the things um, you can do is to pay attention to like the interior window treatments too, because if if you're not willing to, or you can't do something on the outside, um, it does make a difference what color like your shades and stuff are, or whether they can see like on my porch at home, birds can see through the corner. And so I put curtains up so they can't see through the corner anymore. Um, and I stopped getting strikes on the front of my porch. But black shades um, make a reflection where those black blinds are in the middle. We actually, uh, my interns and I went over there and scraped all the tint out of those windows because they were really bad for bird strikes and it was very mirrored. And then the college went right back and put in those black shades. Um, fortunately, they are open most of the time. And so we do not see a lot of strikes on that side of the building um, anymore despite the fact that they put black shades in. On that picture on the left, where you can see there's untinted versus tinted, that is actually our president's office and his conference room. We do not get bird strikes on the left side of that where it's not tinted. We only get bird strikes on the section that's tinted and mirrored. You can see it's very mirrored. And then even having um, white blinds. So we have white vertical blinds in a lot of offices still, and we don't, if the blinds are pulled, we do not get um, strikes on those windows generally. So uh, window decals with the right spacing, there's lots of options and information available at American Bird Conservancy. They have like a whole web page dedicated just to bird strikes and all the different things you can do. Um, you can see in these photos here, the one on the left, because the stripes are, are going up and down, they can be spaced a little wider. The middle one would be the perfect thing, dots at two by two inches. And the third one is, um, it will help, but it is not ideal. Those spaces in between are too big and you will still get small birds that to hit there. Having decorative hangings, um, outdoor curtains or Zen curtains, the Ecopian bird savers, um, that website is great. You can either buy those or they, they have uh, instructions on how to make your own, and they are the least expensive thing I think that you can put up that will stop birds from running into your windows. Window paints, markers on the exterior, you got to break up that reflection. Those also help. Um, don't wash your windows before migration. Uh, I find that the college tends to do it, um, well, they do it like every two months. It often falls right before migration or in migration. And almost immediately after they wash the windows, we will have like one to three bird strikes. And by immediately, I mean like sometimes within hours. And then they they go down right after that because the windows start to get dirty again. So um, clean windows are the enemies of birds. Um, exterior shades, louvers, awnings, and the old fashioned window screen. If you live in a house like mine, we have exterior screens over the glass. So bird strikes, I they do bounce off the screens once in a while near the bird feeder, but otherwise we do not get bird strikes. And then if you only have inside options, if it's a very high up window or you live in an apartment and you've noticed it's a problem on your windows, um, contrasting patterns and light colors can often help to reduce the number of bird strikes that you will get. Um, something's better than nothing doesn't mean that's gonna fix it completely. 
So that is pretty much what I have. Um, if anybody has any questions. Yeah. Oh, so SL Harris. Um, yes, I know about Wild Souls Rescue and Rehab. Um, on the on the Missouri side, yes. And the birds from downtown go to Lakeside Nature Center, but we're in Kansas, so uh, we have to go to Operation Wildlife, which is in near Eudora, let's say. <laughs> um, can you draw your own dots to the windows and how big do the dots need to be? That's from Kristen List. Um, yes, you can draw your own dots on the windows. I don't know. Our dots are a quarter inch, so they don't have to be very big. The spacing of them and the fact that they break up the reflection, is, I think, is probably more important than the size. And then if you if you want them really small, if you could use lighter colors, and if you want them to be a darker color, I'd say go with a bigger dot. Um, does light reflection on water, this is Kristen again, influence light pollution or affect wildlife? Ooh, I don't know the answer to that. I, I do know that um water birds can be fooled by lights on concrete thinking that it's water and we do have this weird thing where we have gotten two to three soras every year and none of them are ever near a building they're always in a parking lot on this light gray concrete that we have and i i am um suspicious that that's kind of what may be happening yeah, you notice a similar thing with American coots. And the same yes, right. Either. That's a problem downtown. I've yet to have a coot here, thankfully. <laughs> oh, hey, Teresa. Jackson County and has the open globe style street fixtures. Um, okay, so a new housing development is being built in eastern Jackson County and has the open globe style street fixtures with so much sh light shining up into the sky. The lights are already installed, but the developer is expanding, so there might be a chance to influence lighting decisions going forward, she said optimistically. <laughs> I do not live in that development, so I'm guessing my pool is limited or non-existent. Any suggestions for action on this kind of situation? Um, I don't know. Is there an, Do they have an HOA? I wonder if you could um, influence the people that are already living there to change it for the rest of the people that will live there. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly how to approach that. I'll think about it. I'll talk to you, Teresa. Crystal, what do you think about related to that? Mm -hmm. People trying to move forward, whether it's a neighborhood, or even citywide, especially in some of our suburban areas or townships within like the Casey limits or St. Louis limits or whatever, um, working with elected officials on ordinances for lighting, particularly. I mean, I think that's probably this, the, the better solution. It's just the longest one, maybe. I don't know, the longest one to get results with them. Once it's implemented, the results are fast. Um, but hitting up like one neighborhood or one group or whatever is also the very slow way to go. So um, I think that policy is probably the better thing. And um, so that's what we've done at the college. We actually, two years ago, got written into policy about sustainability. So now I can sort of whip that thing out whenever I need it um, to sort of, you know, push the point that we need to be doing something about it. I guess this is the related question from Rebecca. What can we do to help the businesses and people to change their practices of lighting? Um, and a related question from Jackie about working with neighbors. And I think Ethan and I will pr try and put some dark sky um fact sheets and things in the chat because there are 
sort of templates for dealing with this, but just like overall impression of like trying to work with people. Yeah. So I think um, um, Lights Out Heartland has some stuff and Dark Sky has some stuff available, good resources for that. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. Asking your neighbors. So the place that we go in Colorado out in the San Luis Valley is actually designated a dark sky space. And yet one of the places we go to observe the sky, there is a neighbor that's probably half a mile away with a light so bright that it obscures some of the sky. So um, I, it's annoying and I don't know. I don't know how to approach it exactly, but yeah, there are resources out there. Uh, Frank mentioned in the chat that the builder often yeah. controls the HOA until all the lots are sold. So that's an interesting perspective about well, potentially yeah. working with builders, yeah. developers, architects. Um, yeah, planners, architects are planners. one of the one of the places where both with window strikes and lighting, um, because on our campus the architects spec all the lighting. But they will spec what you tell them to. Like if you tell them you need dark sky lighting, then that's what they will spec. So it is important to get the word out to architects. Um, but the builder, I don't know, I guess I would approach them and see if they're, um, show them some of the information and see if they're they're open to it. If they control the HOA <laughs> right now. So... Um, were those paintings on windows or crocheted designs posted? Posted. I'm not exactly sure what that means. Brenda, can you clarify for us? Were they posted? In the meanwhile, Victor has an interesting question. Are there any direction facing windows that have a greater chance of strike than others, north facing versus east facing? Oh, so it turns out, well, it seemed that way at first when I started the bird study that north facing windows seemed to be the worst. But over time, I have, I believe, I understand that because the north is the broadest section of buildings we have with glass that face the outside of campus where there's the most trees, that that's actually the cause and not because birds happen to be flying north. Um, so what I have found to be on our campus, the biggest driver of uh, birds hitting windows is having pretty much a line of trees that go up to the windows, I'd say within 20 or 30 feet of the windows and having the canopy reflect in, in the windows at whatever height. I mean, really small trees don't seem to be an issue, but once they get to be 12 feet or taller, um, I've noticed the birds sort of use them like little runways and they fly along the treetops. And then when that last treetops reflected in the glass and it does not matter if it's the whole treetop or 12 inches, they will fly into it. So um, trees are, play a much bigger part in it than like direction. Oh, interesting. Crystal, that makes me think of the T-Mobile Center. Um, I sometimes wonder, like the east and northeast sides are the worst, but there it, but it is also the spot with the most windows. So I've often thought, like, hey, is this because sunrise and you know it's most reflective oh. in the early morning? Yeah, but there's like other like confounding variables that occur. So. There is, and and actually, um, now that you bring that up, there is one building that, um, in late fall, during sunset at five o'clock between five and maybe 5.30, I will get a call almost every day that a bird has hit the window. So that is from the reflection of the setting sun at just, and it lasts for like a week and then it's over. So um, the reflection, like that really hard light reflection from the rising or setting sun, I do think does play some into it as well. 
Um, oh, so the it says anonymous attendee. The last slideshow colored things showed colored things on the windows. Were they painted or were they things taped or attached to the windows? Will birds see things taped to the inside of the windows? Depends on the reflection. Um, but I have found that if we put white shades inside buildings and not black shades, that we get less strikes on those buildings um, because the reflection is white shades like kind of bleed the reflection out. And um, so if you can do light colors and patterns and stuff like that, like it messes with the reflection in a way that the birds understand that's not a tree. Unless the windows are highly reflective, right? Like mirrored, then they can't see through them at all. And nothing you do on the inside is going to help. So um, let's see. Do the dots on the windows help override the bird's sense of seeing the tree reflections? They do. They break it up in a way that they understand um, that there's something there. So, and I've seen both hummingbirds and a hawk um, fly almost right up to the dots. And then all of a sudden the hawk had to like pull back, right? And the hummingbirds seem to, they like kind of flit around them and they're like, okay, okay, yeah, we can't go through there. So um, I don't know exactly what the mechanism is, but they seem to understand when you break up that reflection, like you can't go that direction. Um, how do you account for fewer bird strikes in the autumn? I don't know. I mean, so this year we had, um, we actually had 38 strikes in May and we had 38 in fall migration, which is three months long. So, um, over time it gets, it gets pretty close, but I think a lot of it has to do with the way birds travel because we don't get the same migration patterns through here every year. So that could have sort of just been a fluke. Or it may be that the birds are flying, let's see, in the fall they're flying south. Yeah, that's the north side of my campus. That's the worst side. So I don't I don't really know. Crystal. So could, sorry, Ethan, go ahead. There could be disparities in those patterns um, based on just the the imperative to migrate isn't quite the same in the falls as in the spring. Well, that's true. Um, so the, the Zunguru is a little different. And then also, uh, um, yeah, the lighting angles could be different as well. And then um, I, I was thinking there's a th another third aspect. That, oh, which is intriguing about that question is you would anticipate that there would be more strikes in the fall because obviously there'd be more birds produced in the fall to be migrating through. So it's a very interesting observation. Definitely mm -hmm. something to pay attention to. I just want to point out, Crystal, that you, like an important thing I think for people to remember is that you have the same amount of effort, right? Yeah. Like you do your surveys the same amount so that you can really say yeah. that, that you have fewer strikes in fall than in spring. And if you varied the effort varied like the survey walking you wouldn't be able to say that with certainty correct and um so after the first year where we literally walked almost every 24 hours every day for the entire year um we we have pulled back a little so we we walk now from um well near the near the end of march i'm starting to train people this week um and mostly because they need volunteer hours for classes. <laughs> and I, once I get them started, I get to keep them. So, but usually like mid um, April to mid June, and then we walk that fall. Um, we start in August and we walk through Thanksgiving and, and we have pretty much the same coverage at all, you know, those periods every year. So those numbers I feel are, are good comparisons. In the, pardon me, in the chat, uh, Scott asked what was the website that showed live bird migration and Teresa Enderly put that in the chat, birdcast.info. Oh, thank you. I haven't, sorry, I didn't look at the chat. 
Thank you, it's, Teresa. <laughs> it's hard to keep up with all of it. I know. The, that website's addicting. I look at it every single morning during migration season <laughs> to know what I'm going to face that morning. So I'm putting a little bit of info in the chat. Um, Bird Safe Kansas City, uh, which is which takes place on the Missouri side. We have a few routes. We're having a volunteer training this coming Saturday at the Anita B. Gorman Discovery Center on Troost, one to three. Um, I'm going to put this in the chat, but please email me if you are in the Kansas City area and interested in committing some time to surveying for deceased birds on the streets of Kansas City. So somebody got some reflecting strips from you? That would probably be feather friendly, which are... Um, very, very much like the dots that Crystal showed. They just come in strips and you can put them on the outside of your own residential windows. So Feather Friendly is another good product. Crystal, way earlier in the chat, someone asked about window alerts, comments. Is that those UV ones? They're UV and they're like in nice shape. So they're like quite decorative, but the spacing is always an yeah. issue, right? Yes. I, I've been asked before if the hawk silhouettes work, and my answer is yes, if you put them every two inches. I would say so, like doing something is better than nothing, right? But oh, I think okay. your data showed what you showed about even with the dots, like properly spaced, when you treated one window, birds would kind of move over to the next reflective window. So coverage is important, huh? Coverage is important. Spacing is important. On those dots, we spaced at four inches. We still got warblers, but we didn't get bigger birds, right? So the closer your dots are, if you have hummingbirds around, you definitely want to do that two by two inch spacing. Mm -hmm. Looks like our last question in the Q&A, Tina Potts or possibly Jeannie, that might be you. I know you guys watch together sometimes. Um, could the lighting issue be shared with Ameren or or the electric co-ops to have them promote dark sky options and bird friendly lighting? Would love to have ins to do that. <laughs> yes. Um, Evergy in the Kansas City, like in some mid Missouri area, does have a green team, and they have expressed some interest in this topic and. What was to me surprising was that they actually do have their own reasons for wanting to keep energy usage kind of under control. So they are not against, you know, dark sky practices, turning off lights, turning lights onto motion sensors. So there is some hope there. Someone asked about hanging danglies off the overhang. That was Linda. Yes, you can have you can hang danglies off the overhang. And actually, if you if they're away from the window, they'll cast a shadow on the window too, and that's almost like a double treatment because um, it it reduces the amount of spacing visually. Thanks, Melinda, for putting your question again in the chat because it was at the very beginning. The photo in Minnesota with the northern lights was it taken around Lake Superior, and what time of year was the question from her? Oh yes, um, it was taken in. Um, Ely, Ely, Minnesota. And that's what it looks like in the middle of the summer. Yeah, I grew up with that. It was amazing. <laughs> Road trip <laughs> check. I'm I'm there. <laughs> yep. Um Sherry Ann mentions the screens on our windows seem to be protective. Any comments there? Yeah, if you have exterior screens, that's absolutely protective. Because if nothing else, it's a trampoline if they hit it. And it just bounces them back into back into the world, and they're usually just fine. Okay. Just kind of surfing around here, trying to see if we missed things. Ethan, you want to come do drone drone flyovers? Yeah, a, we can work. We can work something out. No at problem. Like midnight. Yep. Okay. We can do that. Yeah. We have a drone here, but nobody wants to work at midnight. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm certified, and I have uh, the beacon up on top there. Three statute miles is a spec on that. Nice. But All right, I'll figure out uh, how to get permissions. Uh, there's no. We're good. <laughs> um, y'all. Rebecca asked, "What about window feeders? Those are really popular. Are those dangerous if they're used with the dots? You know, like a... used with the dots, I would think they'd be fine." Those ones that stick to your window? I believe that's what she means, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think they'd be fine if you um, have dots on your window. That would be, like, best case scenario if you're going to use one. And if a bird comes to that feeder, I realize without dots there could be a reflectivity problem, but say you have dots and one of those feeders... Yeah, they're not going to I mean, if they're on the feeder, they're not going to fly <laughs> to the window with any kind of speed to that. Yeah, would cause that would injury, be far enough right? away. Yeah, they're they're inches from it. Um, so, yeah, it's. The birds usually are, that are going at a really good clip are the ones that um, that end up getting killed or injured, but. Thanks, Ethan. We'll just show up at midnight. <laughs> so there's a lot of folks kind of saying um, in the chat that this is good info that can be implemented in their daily lives. And good. I'm glad to hear those comments because, yes, we can all help very, very much on this particular topic. <laughs> um a friend has a hawk that has learned to chase birds into windows anything that can be done about that so we've killed two cooper's hawks i believe they were chasing birds um possibly into the windows and messed up on the bridges that we have um we have not killed a hawk on not a cooper's hawk um since we put dots on the bridges so I think it would work because the bird's not going to fly towards the window if it has dots on it. And then, um, yeah, that Cooper's Hawk's going to have to learn a new trick. Do inside screens work to prevent strikes? Probably not um, because they don't break up the reflection and they're not the right color to sort of dampen it either. Um, and then Monica asks if there's fixtures designated dark sky. There are. You can like Google dark sky light fixtures, and they'll they'll come right up. Monica, too. Ethan and I put a couple links in the chat before um, for darksky.org, and then lights out Heartland as well. Um, and. If you check out those websites, surf around a little bit, um, there's quite a bit of information on light fixtures and, and lighting uh, temperatures, colors, if you will. So they're pretty, it, it's a fairly easy fix. And as Crystal talked about, it's a lot better for us as well, um, physiologically speaking. <laughs> yes. And like, I like my lights around my house on... Um motion detectors it sucks during a storm when the trees are waving around but otherwise like as soon as something walks into like the you know area of my house a light pops on and I'm always like what is that you know I can look out the window like nobody could approach my house without the light popping on and then I would probably see that happen and then I would check it out as opposed to if the lights are just always on I would never know if somebody was sort of walking around the house mm -hmm. or a coyote <laughs> a coyote set off the light <laughs> sherry says we love these monday night videos and have learned so much but we have come to call them doom and gloom zooms <laughs> sorry sherry ann um that picture I had up before of the April series, we're trying not to be so doomy and gloomy. <laughs> um, but I'm glad you all come to these because the you know we can we can really help these birds and other wildlife and knowledge is power. So 
right. You so know, I all the all the Leopold said that those with an ecological understanding live alone in a world of wounds, but we're with you guys, so we're not really alone. There you go. <laughs> um looks like one last question here, Crystal. What about using yellow light bulbs? says Francis. I mean that goes on the warm color i as long as the bugs don't still aren't attracted to it i don't know about yellow light bulbs exactly but i do think that that was a thing once wasn't it yellow or francis might mean the the warmer on the spectrum yeah um, I think... i'm actually googling it <laughs> yeah i think if francis if that is what you mean about like warmer colors because i know that there are literally like colored light bulbs that are mm, decorative um does yellow light bulbs keep bugs away yeah. hmm so it keeps down uh, the number of insects are not attracted to them as they are to white lights so yeah yep so here's um I guess dark dark sky folks call them warm colored and um yeah so Melinda and Christine both remember Doug telling me a couple weeks ago um suggesting yellow lights so warmer lights so I'm putting in the chat another just a page on specifically lighting principles from darksky.org and one of them is um using warmer color lights when possible and That's they're easier on our eyes too. Yeah. Just, I mean, I realize that everyone on these webinars cares about wildlife, but if you are talking to someone else, you might want to just remind them that it's better for us also. Lisa, true. Not all of them are the same. This is true. So again, um, we'd refer you to... Um, Dark Sky, Lights at Heartland, and others that um, give like really specific suggestions and guidelines for um, human, wildlife, and astronomy friendly lighting. Yes, the increasing frequency and the and the decreased uh, wavelengths and uh, blue light in particular creates problems. So you want a decreased frequency or a decreased wavelength in it. Yeah. yeah. Decreased decreased wavelength is that blue light. You know, think of those um how, those hot lights, those blue LEDs and things that really seem to really startle you. Avoid that. I used to own a sign company, right? And we sold it's back in the day when there was still neon wasn't all LED, but um, I would highly suggest when people wanted blue neon letters or blue channel letters with blue neon in them, that they not use them because you can barely read them at night because your eye can't like distinguish between the letters very well. And um, so, yeah, if you ever see blue neon or something at night, it's very hard to read the lettering compared to every other color. Mary cautions yellow LEDs can still have some ultraviolet waves that we can't see, but still affect wildlife. So check the details on the light bulbs when you buy them. Yep. Incandescent zone on the warm range. So this is getting into the lighting of LEDs being more energy efficient and therefore we're for them from a climate standpoint, but they often either are the blue or white side of the spectrum or they have ultraviolet so just be careful and they are um, labeled very good all right everybody if there's no more questions it's time for good night crystal thank you so much thank um a lot thank of you. lot of info people can use yep right. yep so thank you and reach, right, out, reach out if you have questions.
Thanks. All right. Good night.